Hello, BISC 132. This is the beginning of recorded lecture 2.2, two, uh, continuing on with chapter 24, fungi. Uh, now getting into fungi symbiotic relationships. Uh, there are three of these I want to go through, um, starting with one called mycorrhizae. A weird spelling of this word, but it, it's pronounced mycorrhizae. Um, the key terms define this as a mutualistic relationship between a plant and a fungus. And if we look at this, this at first glance doesn't look very mutualistic. Uh, these fungal hyphae uh, in, in some types are getting into, you know, past the cell walls, into the cytoplasm of the plants. This looks like some sort of uh, horrible parasitic invasion of the plant cells. But as you know, the, the key terms defined, this is actually mutualism. So what's going on here is the hyphae, as we mentioned you know, earlier in this chapter, are really good at absorbing stuff from the surroundings. Uh, as good as roots are, uh, mycelium and fungal hyphae are the champions of absorbing nutrients from the surroundings. But the problem is, they need nutrients, carbon, in the surroundings in order to actually survive. So the partnership here is that the plant will do photosynthesis and in doing so create sugars and give those sugars to the fungus. In return, the fungal hyphae will absorb mineral nutrients from the soil and water, things that the roots can do on their own, but mycelium can do even better. And it will give the, this water and these mineral nutrients to the plant in exchange for the, the, the sugars, the carbon. So fungus uses hyphae to absorb water and mineral nutrients for the plant. In return, the plant gives sugars from photosynthesis to the fungus. So they're both benefiting from this. The fungus wouldn't be able to survive in this environment anyway because there's no organic matter, you know, decaying organic matter for it to absorb. There are no nutrients, just, you know, mineral nutrients. You can't survive off of those alone. There is no organic matter for the fungus, but they're getting it from the plant sugars. And the plant benefits from this. I mean, the plant could survive without the fungus, but it benefits because it gets a more e efficient uptake of these mineral nutrients and water from the surroundings. So mutualism. And here's a, you can, this is, there have been scientific studies, of course, but this is, you know, from a, a website trying to sell this stuff that without mycorrhizae, with mycorrhizae, the plant benefits from this. The plant grows faster, the plant grows taller and larger. Premium mycorrhizae, plant success. Um, this little shaker bottle to just, I guess, shake into your potting soil to ensure that this relationship establishes itself. Um, yeah, this definitely benefits the plant and it benefits the fungus as well. Um, interestingly, this is extremely commonplace. About 90% of all vascular plant species uh, can have this relationship. Most plants are capable of having this uh, if they manage to, you know, come in contact with the right fungi. Uh, there are two types of mycorrhizae, uh, as we saw here. Uh, ectomycorrhizae is uh, when the fungal hyphae do not penetrate the root cells of the plant. They sort of go around. That's ectomycorrhizae. The other, uh, the, also in the key terms, endomycorrhizae, also known as arbuscular mycorrhizae, uh, is when the fungal hyphae do penetrate the cell walls of the root cells uh, and sort of get more in there. So both of these are in the key terms. And if you remember, swinging back around uh, our muscular mycorrhizae, I mentioned these before uh, when we were talking uh, about this specific group of fung uh, fungi, the glomeromycota. So just tying things back around again. Okay. So that's mycorrhizae. That's one type of symbiotic relationship involving a fungus. Another uh, common uh, fungal symbiotic relationship is lichen. So uh, there are many types of lichen and you know different shapes and sizes and forms, you know, the crustose folios and fruticose. Uh, but uh, lichen itself is defined in the key terms as 
a close association of a fungus with a photosynthetic alga or bacterium. So that's kind of generic because the actual partner that the fungus can have uh, varies widely. So yeah, like the, like the key terms just said, it can be a bacterium, it can be a quote-unquote alga, which could mean plant, could mean protist. The important thing is that the partner is something that does photosynthesis. So once again, we have the fungus growing in an environment that does not have readily available nutrients for, for it to absorb. Uh, this could be growing on a brick or a rock uh, or tree bark, you know, a tree that's not dead. So it's not, you know, stealing nutrients from the tree. It's just hanging out here. Uh, all fungi are heterotrophs. They need nutrients they need carbon to survive so their partner uh, just like the partner in mycorrhizae uh, is something that does photosynthesis so you can imagine the give and take here the partner provides sugars from photosynthesis and the fungus provides protection fungal cell walls are very protective and oftentimes this partner you know whether it's a eukaryote or a prokaryote or, or whatever uh, is used to living in an aquatic environment in a pond or something like that algae algae is not going to survive you know living on the side of a rock it's not going to survive living on the side of a tree outside of water but if it's partnered with fungi it can survive in this condition so here's a don't sweat the details here, but uh, here's a, a cross section of lichen. And you can see here in this zone, uh, the, the algae protected on, on all sides by the hyphae, by the mycelium of this fungus, keeping it, you know, completely protected. Um, this, we can consider this to be mutualism. Um, kind of looks like they're captured. <laughs> There's, in, in biology, they're, they're often a, a sort of gray zone of like, are they being protected or are they prisoners? But I mean, we can we can rest assured that these algae would not be able to survive at all in these environments without this protection. So we can we could call this mutualism. The algae get protection, uh, and the 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 fungus gets nutrients, gets sugars that it wouldn't otherwise get. Okay. The third is even weirder. So another uh, fungi fungal symbiotic relationship uh, involves leaf cutter ants. So leaf cutter ants earn their name well because they cut off pieces of leaves and they carry them sometimes long distances uh, back to their home. So if you were to see, you know, a bunch of ants like this, you know, carrying leaves down here, you would probably guess that they're, you know, saving these leaves to eat in the winter, or they're, they're going to eat them later, or maybe they're feeding these leaves to their queen, or maybe they're feeding these leaves to their young, but all of those things would be wrong. Uh, what they are doing is far more bizarre. Uh, what these ants are doing is they are bringing these leaves down into their, their colony, to feed to a fungus. These are gardeners. They have domesticated a fungus and they feed it with these leaves and then they will eat some of the fungus themselves. Just like we will, you know, care for the plants in our garden and then eat some of the products of those plants. Uh, these fungus growing ants provide this fungus with all the sugars it needs from these leaves uh, and in return eat some of it uh, for for sustenance. So we call these fungus growing ants, several different species here, uh, also known as leaf cutter ants. They feed leaves to the fungus. They they care for the fungus. Uh, you know they will uh, they will weed it. If you know if other species of fungus start growing on it and harming it, they'll they'll clip those away. Just like you weed a garden, they'll care for this fungus and and then they'll eat some of this fungus. And the fungus itself is uh, again you can call this domesticated. It really can't survive outside of this environment. It has evolved alongside these ants 
uh, its ability to live when it's not being completely taken care of uh, is very limited. So this is a domesticated fungus, just like we'd have you know, a, a domesticated animal. Uh, and we can consider this to be mutualism. The fungus has a pretty cushy job here. All it has to do is grow and break down things that are brought to it. Uh, and the ants definitely benefit from this as well. This is their sole source of food, uh, eating this fungus. So another example uh, of mutualism. Now, uh, to, to get away from uh, the love and good times mutualism here, there are plenty of fungi that are parasites and pathogens. Uh, and just like the parasites and pathogens of, of previous chapters, the, the textbook goes into some detail describing these. I'm not going to make you memorize a big laundry list of these, but there are a lot of uh, fungal pathogens that affect plants. Uh, a lot of times plants that we really rely on as sources of food, so these have substantial economic impact. Um, additionally, there are plenty of pathogens that infect us uh, directly. Here's a ringworm. Many species can, can cause this. Again, despite worm in the name, this is a fungal infection, not an actual worm. Um, Here's a species of fungus, fungus uh, responsible for athlete's foot or jock itch, uh, and, and some even cause pretty bad lung infections. So again, don't memorize all these. All I want to say is this uh, human fungal infections uh, definitely exist uh, and can be difficult to treat. So antibiotics will take down a bacterium, uh, but fungal infections, I mean, fungi are eukaryotes just like us. So if you're going to treat it with some you know chemical compound, some drug, it has to target fungi in a way that doesn't also target our animal cells. So because we're both eukaryotes, it's much more challenging to deal with these infections. Not impossible, but more challenging uh, be because we're both eukaryotes. Uh, definitely no antibiotics for a fungal infection. And another section here that I'm you know largely skipping because you know, just not important to make you uh, memorize which fungi are involved in, in agriculture or, or whatever there is one thing I do want to say you know from uh, this section uh, is to introduce uh, for the first time and not for the last time the concept of a model organism uh, some fungi especially Aspergillus, uh, are important model organisms. A model organism is defined in the key terms as a species that researchers study and use as a model to understand the biological processes in other species represented by the model organism. That's kind of a mouthful, but these, these, are, these are lab rats, these are lab mice, these are species that we can experiment on and uh, study and understand as a way to understand us, humans, human development, human disease. I just finished saying that, you know, fungi are eukaryotes just like we are, that's a liability when treating infections, but it's a good thing when we're trying to understand things. It's way easier to grow a fungus, especially a yeast, than it is to try to grow human cells. But because we're both eukaryotes, they actually do a lot of the same things we do. So some fundamental processes of, of cell biology and, and uh, cell division and, and th cell cycle control, even though they seem so far removed from us as animals, we're both eukaryotes. And so a lot of fungi are very important uh, research specimens uh, and because they serve uh, as very effective, very easy to use and grow model organisms for understanding all eukaryotes and, and you know applying this to humans. And that does it for fungi. So uh, moving on, uh, we now come to plants. Uh, plants are going to be divided into actually several chapters. We're starting with you know chapter 25, seedless plants. So uh, what are plants? Well, we've brought these up before. There's this fun thing again. Uh, plants were located here in this supergroup, Archaea plastida. Uh, this is a clade, a monophyletic group, an ancestor and all of its descendants all you know share this name of being called plants. So kingdom plantae, a monophyletic group. Uh, all plants are photoautotrophs. There's this figure again, so that means they get their energy from sunlight. 
and they get their carbon from inorganic sources, from CO2. Um, they are distinct from a red or brown algae, which again we discussed in a previous chapter. These are protists due to, again, without showing you the details because it's, it's too you know, fiddly, uh, different photosynthetic pigments. So yeah, there are other organisms that are photoautotrophs, but this is a, a distinct monophyletic group. They have distinct photosynthetic pigments that you know, separate them from these other photoautotrophs. So this was a useful figure when we were looking at all eukaryotes, but if we want to look at plants, uh, it, it's better to sort of zoom in. So here's a phylogenetic tree uh, showing plants. Let's orient ourselves. It's a rooted phylogenetic tree, uh, an ancestor of all plants, and, and showing all of its descendants. And what's going to be pretty cool about this, in, in my opinion, is this phylogenetic tree uh, kind of looks like a staircase going up. So what we will be able to do as we go through this is uh, keep track of evolutionary innovations. We are going to start simple and we are going to, in a stepwise fashion, add new features, add new bells and whistles, add new cool uh, Evolutionary innovations is the best phrase I could think of until we get to the, the most recent plants, the most sophisticated plants that have an accumulation of all these cool things that have evolved one at a time. So let's start with the simplest stuff. The earliest plants were aquatic, that we call green algae. And if you think about plants and photosynthesis, it makes sense that the earliest plants were aquatic. Photosynthesis you know, uses up water. It consumes H2O. If you need, if you have a constant need for H2O, it, the aquatic lifestyle makes perfect sense. So the earliest plants were aquatic. They're called green algae. Um, algae is a terrible word. <laughs> you know, there, there are some protists that get called algae. There are even some bacteria that are called blue-green algae and other plants that are called algae. That's why I'm using the quotes here, green algae. Algae can confuse you a lot, but if you see green algae, we're, we're talking about the group of plants. Um, these plants are capable of asexual and sexual reproduction. There are two major groups of uh, green algae, chlorophytes and charophytes. Uh, chlorophytes, some of these are unicellular, and that's weird because once we get out of algae land, all plants are going to be uh, multicellular. So you know, kind of weird to see single-celled plants, but yeah, here we are. Uh, don't memorize all these, by the way. These are just, you know, fun examples. So yeah, all of these are aquatic, some of these being single-celled, some of these being multicellular. Uh, so these are chlorophytes uh, and charophytes. These are also under the umbrella of green algae. They're more closely related to land plants, but they're still all aquatic. So here are some charophytes living, uh, living in the water. There's a unicellular one, pretty cool looking, but uh, yeah, these are also algae. These are the charophytes algae. Okay, so uh, that's all I want to say about these, uh, these aquatic plants, these, uh, these green algae. Our next evolutionary innovation is going to be the ability to live on land because as you know as cushy as it is to live in the water as a photosynthetic organism uh, a third of the planet is land and that is a new untapped territory there is definitely selective pressure to be able to survive in the harsher environment of of being on land so Advantages to life on land include less competition. You know, the waters are starting to get crowded. If you can survive on land, it's, there's, there's less competition there. Uh, more sunlight. You know, as a photoautotroph, you need light as a source of energy. Water filters out some of that energy, so being on land gives you a more direct source of this, uh, this energy. Uh, and no predators. Well, at least at first, they'll come later, but uh, an, an early selective pressure to colonize a land means uh, not as many things trying to eat you. However, uh, despite all these advantages, there are definitely a lot of challenges related to, to being able to survive on land. Uh, first and foremost, you need to not dry out. You know, the sun provides energy for photosynthesis, but the sun will also evaporate water. And so being able to survive in a drier environment is something that needs to be overcome. 
You also need to transport water to the photosynthetic organs. When you're surrounded by water, this doesn't matter, but if you're on land, you need some way to sort of move this stuff to where it needs to go. Um, you also need to support the weight of the plant body. Again, you're you know, somewhat weightless underwater, but gravity weighs down on you a lot more when you're outside of water, so this is also a challenge. And uh, the sperm need to get to the eggs. Uh, again, we're talking about organisms that have a sexual life cycle. Sperm plus egg equals a zygote. Uh, in, in water, they can easily swim to get to the eggs, but on land, that's going to be a lot more challenging. So this is another uh, issue that's going to come up when we talk about how land plants manage to survive on land. So uh, we're done with chlorophytes and charophytes. All further groups that we're going to talk about are going to fall under this umbrella category of land plants. All further groups are quote-unquote land plants. And all land plants have what's called a haplodiplontic life cycle. Yes, more life cycle stuff. Don't worry, this is not as complicated as the fungi stuff. So here is a very generic haplodiplontic life cycle, but again, this is important to understand because all further plants in this chapter and the next one are going to, to follow this life cycle. So there are two important things to, to notice here. One is, you know, the N and the 2N. So 2N means diploid, two copies of each chromosome. We should be used to this. We are diploid. N, or sometimes called 1N, means haploid. It means one copy of each chromosome. Uh, we only use this in our eggs and sperm. But what's strange, strange from our perspective, about the haplodiplontic life cycle is that these plants have a multicellular structure that is diploid and a multicellular structure that is haploid. And again, that's foreign to us because we are multicellular diploid, but our haploid stuff, our eggs and sperm, don't form multicellular structures. They just fuse and, and become diploid again. Uh, so these two forms of the plant are called the sporophyte and the gametophyte. The sporophyte is the multicellular diploid. The gametophyte is the multicellular haploid. I've got it written down here. Sporophytes equals multicellular diploids, 2N being sort of the shorthand for diploid. Gametophytes are the multicellular haploids, 1N or N. Importantly, if you're wondering, okay, it's got two forms, well, which one's the plant? Uh, it depends on the species. It depends on the group. Uh, in some groups, the sporophyte, you're going to you know, look at a plant and say, oh, that's the sporophyte. The gametophyte's like microscopic. But in other plants, the gametophyte is the plant, and the sporophyte is some tiny little reproductive structure. So either one of these may be the, the prominent form of the plant. So... Let's go through this cycle now. Again, it's a, it's a circle. There's really no beginning or ending, but let's uh, let's start here just to be arbitrary. We'll start with the sporophyte um, producing uh, single-celled spores through the process of meiosis. Just like our meiosis makes eggs and sperm diploid to haploid, their meiosis is making spores that are haploid. These are not eggs and sperm. Egg, the, the job of egg or sperm uh, is to fuse together, but that's not the job of these spores. The job of these haploid spores is to divide by mitosis and form this haploid gametophyte. So, again, to, to number these steps, just to, to have this, the sporophyte, 2N, produces unicellular haploid spores through the process of meiosis. The spores will divide by mitosis to form this multicellular haploid gametophyte form. So it, it's called the sporophyte because it makes spores. Makes sense. The gametophyte is called the gametophyte because it makes gametes. Uh, gamete is just a term that refers to egg or sperm. So the gametophyte makes egg or sperm. Some of you have female gametophytes that only make eggs and male gametophytes that only make sperm, but either way, it's making a gamete of one form or another. Uh, the egg and the sperm find each other, they fuse, 
one plus one is two. You know, you have two haploid cells forming one diploid zygote, which is then going to divide and form the multicellular sporophyte. So the gametophyte produces gametes. That means eggs or sperm, as the case may be, by the process of mitosis. Uh, egg plus sperm fuse to form a zygote, which again, one plus one is two. The zygote is diploid 2n. And then the zygote divides by mitosis to form the sporophyte 2n. We're right back uh, to where we started. So very very good uh, figure as sort of a roadmap to, to everything to come. We're going to see some small variations on this in the future, but for the most part, this is, uh, this is a good thing to keep in the back of your head. All further plants have a haplodiplontic life cycle. So the first land plants were a group of plants called bryophytes. So the, the earliest land plants were bryophytes. I'm, I'm double underlining this because there are going to be a couple of groups uh, of bryophytes. Uh, and I, I do want to point out, like, I'm trying to make this as, as clear as possible when I'm talking about, you know, groups that contain other groups and, you know, where they're located and their relationships. And I'm, I'm trying to make that clear in, in the notes here. But additionally, I have a document on Moodle called Plants and Organizational Study Aid or, or something like that. It doesn't contain any new information, so you don't need uh, to read this. Everything you need is, is in these uh, slides with text. Uh, but if, if you want just another way to, to visually show which groups are part of which other groups and stuff like that, that document exists on Moodle. Anyway, so bryophytes, the earliest land plants. Uh, their uh, gametophyte is prominent and their sporophyte is hard to see. So uh, just to, to look at this, this, if you're, you're looking at this, it kind of looks like a leaf. It's not a leaf, but it kind of looks like a leaf. This is the gametophyte. The sporophyte is going to be a small little structure we'll see later that just kind of sticks up. So prominent gametophyte in these bryophytes. Um, importantly, these are the first land plants, uh, and so they are not the best land plants. They, they managed to survive on land, uh, but not very effectively. Uh, they do not have any vascular tissue. So vascular tissue is going to be something that transports water or nutrients. And um, because they don't have this, they are not able to transport water or nutrients throughout their plant body, uh, which means they have to be small. You only get to be, you know, a big tall oak tree if you have lots of vascular tissue to move stuff from the roots to the leaves and the leaves to everywhere else. Uh, these bryophytes uh, have to be small uh, and they're called non-vascular plants because they, they don't have vascular tissue. Um, this means they don't have roots, uh, so real roots are, are a type of vascular tissue transporting water. Instead of roots, they have things called rhizoids that will anchor them to the ground, but again, not actually transport water around because they're not real roots. Uh, they don't have leaves either. Again, a real leaf has vascular tissue and transports nutrients, you know, um, the products of photosynthesis to other parts of the plant. Uh, they have these structures called phalli, or a phallus is singular, phalli is plural. It looks a lot like a flat leaf, but again, it's not a real leaf uh, because it doesn't have vascular tissue. It, it, it's a photosynthetic organ, but yeah, it's not a real leaf. And if we want to look at their reproduction, Eggs and sperm are produced by this prominent gametophyte on distinct structures. So it looks complicated. There's the phallus we've been looking at. Uh, here's the antheridium and the archegonium. Don't worry about those terms. But here is a structure that on the, on the gametophyte uh, that only produces sperm. And here's a structure on the gametophyte that only produces egg. So I'm trying not to get bogged down in the details here. I'm trying to highlight the important things. Um, this is all just trying to illustrate the point. Eggs and sperm produced by the gametophyte on these distinct structures. These distinct structures can be on the same plant or on different plants. So 
In this particular figure, we're looking at a single plant that has the female structure and the male structure both on the same plant. Uh, but just to look at a different example, here's a different species of bryophyte where you have a female gametophyte that only makes the female structure that makes uh, eggs, and here's a male gametophyte that only has this male structure, the antheridia, that only makes sperm. So it, it could be either way depending on the species. They're produced by the gametophyte on the same plant or on different plants. And uh, as I discussed, one of the issues with land plants is these uh, these eggs and sperm have to somehow get to one another. So they get to one another by swimming, which uh, isn't easy because you're outside of water, but you can still do that if you're in a very moist environment or an environment where it rains a lot. So you can you can see the flagella on these sperm. Uh, if it's uh, you know on the same uh, gametophyte, it's a much easier journey for these sperm to swim over to the eggs. Uh, if you are on different individuals, it's a, a bit more of a difficult journey to for these sperm to swim to another individual uh, to get to the eggs there. Uh, but, but it is something that they manage. Uh, so again, these are land plants, but they're the first land plants or the most primitive land plants. They're not the best at it yet. So they can survive outside of water, but because these sperm need to swim using flagella to get to eggs, they can only live in, in moist environments, in environments where it, where it rains a lot, where there's water around, even if it's not always around, if there's water around uh, for, for, this, for this swimming to happen. Okay, so there's uh, more to say about bryophytes, but this is typically where I run out of time in this lecture. So uh, we'll continue on with bryophytes and other more sophisticated plants next time. This is the end of recorded lecture 2-2.